Tonight I want to talk to us about the battle we must fight. Look at your neighbor and look them in the, in the peepers and say, the battle we must fight. Praise the Lord. You know, there's nothing pretty about war. War is destruction on a massive scale. War is death. War is the forcing of will on another nation or another people or another team. I was studying a little bit and I come across a, a, uh, a speech that General William Sherman gave to a graduating class. And he said, one of the pleasures of being general in chief of the army is the opportunity to travel around this great country. That pleasure includes speaking to bodies such as this. But as I look upon the many eager young faces here at this Michigan Military Academy, I have a feeling that there are many of you who look upon war as all glory. And look to the day when you can use the skill you have acquired here. He told the young lads, suppress it. Suppress it. I say, you don't know the horrible aspect of war. I've been through two wars and I know. I've seen cities and homes burned and in ashes. I've seen thousands of men lying on the ground, their dead faces looking up at the sky. I tell you, war, and I'm not going to use the word he used, war is horrible. You know, there's nothing pretty about war, but the end result of that war can be good. I think of the Civil War. I've been to the battlefield at Vicksburg, and y'all have a Civil War battlefield here around here that I haven't toured yet. Been here three years, and I haven't been there. I'm lacking. But, but the Civil War led to the preservation of the United States of America. The war was a horrible thing. The war was terrible, with approximately 620,000 men dead at the end of that war. But, but there was something good that came out of that war. It was worth fighting to preserve the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Many times throughout our nation's history, war was necessary and required. I think about the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the American Civil War, World War I and II, the Korean conflict, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, and the War on Terror that went on for many, many years, and in ways it's still going on. So sometimes war is necessary to preserve a way of life, to stop evil, Nations and men from taking over good nations. But today I want to talk about a war that I think is the most critical. Pastor Kuhn has been teaching us very well on this warfare that we're involved in. And believe it or not, we are neck deep in spiritual warfare here at Calvary. Praise the Lord. But the most critical war is not a war of tanks, planes, soldiers, and ships. But it's a spiritual war. Right. The battle we are fighting is imperative that we win. We are in a spiritual war as a church. In, in, a, in a spiritual war whose results are manifested in our physical world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, the Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You see, this is a war for our very souls. This is a war, this is a battle for the souls of our family and our friends and all of those that are in our oil costs or our circle of influence. 
The Bible teaches me that our, that our enemy, our mutual enemy, is very knowledgeable of the kind of war we are in. He knows how to use his weapons accurately to cause the most damage. His objective is a scorched earth policy. He wants you destroyed. He don't want you limited. He wants you destroyed. He wants this church destroyed. He wants this truth proclaiming station to cease to exist. Look at your neighbor and say, our enemy wants you spiritually dead. He wants you on the sidelines. He wants you to give up, to throw in the tile, to walk off the battlefield. But that's something we cannot afford to do, church. We cannot afford to walk off the battlefield. We cannot afford to quit. This is a battle that we must fight. The Bible says in John 10 and 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus gave us his plan for all of us. He wants you taken out. He wants me taken out. And believe you me, in the last weeks, I have felt his attacks. I have felt him coming against me and this church. And many of you have felt that. Just because we've decided to pray and we have decided to fast and we've decided to enter into this spiritual warfare does not mean our enemy is giving up and going home. He's going to fight. He does, he does not want to lose ground. He knows that the strongholds uh, and his, uh, his plan and everything he has worked for in the city of Springfield is at risk because there are this group of people that has decided down on North Park Avenue that has decided to walk on the battlefield. He's not going to play dead and walk off and quit. He's going to fight back. Uh, his princes and his angels are going to fight back. Uh, but let me tell you something. Greater is he that is within us uh, than he that is in the world. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's imperative that we stay on the battlefield, that we fight that we keep on keeping on. I told somebody lately, all some days this is going to be is putting one foot in front of the other, but we're making progress. Uh, some days we don't feel the lightning of the Spirit in our soul, uh, but we pray anyway. We stay on the battlefield. I think of Uriah. Y'all remember Uriah? The husband of Bathsheba? Uriah the Hittite. We got to have the spirit of Uriah. He could have he could have been at home with his wife. He could have been at home eating supper and in luxury and and everything could have been hunky dory. But he wanted to be on the battlefield. Uh, he wanted to be where his brothers were and his sisters were. There wasn't any sisters on the battlefield, but in our case, there are. He wanted to be where the nation was fighting for freedom uh, and liberty. Now is not the time for us to be at home. Spiritually, in luxury, and enjoying life. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us so involved with everything but warfare. He wants us to be overcome with the news of the day. He wants us to be overcome with technology and, and things we like to do. It takes effort, it takes time, it takes preparation to be effective in spiritual warfare. Praise the Lord. So it's imperative that we stay on the battlefield because this is a battle we must fight. Look at your neighbor and say, we have got to fight. Let me ask you a question. Is there anybody in your family that's lost? Is there anybody in your circle of influence that's worth fighting for? Do you have children that's not living for God tonight? Are they worth fighting for? 
We cannot allow O Slewfoot to cause us to leave the battlefield. We got to fight. This is a battle we got to fight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pastor Kuhn mentioned the next few scriptures just the other day in his message, and I thought it might be beneficial to review them tonight with the topic that we're discussing. But in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Listen, it's his power and his might that will win this war. We're just tools. We're just bodies. It's his power, his strength, his authority, his awesomeness, his greatness, his authority that's going to win this war. It's our power and might that will lose the war. We have no power in our own selves. Praise the Lord. In Proverbs 3 and 5, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own at, in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Praise the Lord. So it's his strength, his power. It's his war. But we are the ones. We are the body of Christ. We are the hands. We are the mouthpieces to pray. Praise the Lord. Verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I looked up the word wiles. And the wiles of the devil refers to his strategies and deceits. His strategies and his deceits. You know, Jesus said in John 8 and 44 that there is no truth in Satan. Jesus said there is no truth in the devil. He said he is the father of lies. So he's going to come at us with lies and deceits. Be, be careful. Be particularly careful not to believe the lies of the enemy. Right. Y'all remember in World War II there was Tokyo Rose. Y'all remember her? She was a DJ that spoke fluent English and all the, all the uh, troops over there would listen to the radio station because they played American music and they liked the music. But Tokyo Rose would get on there and spread pro- propaganda. That what you're doing is wrong. You're losing the war. And she would spread her lies and propaganda, and there were some soldiers who actually believed it. Let me tell you something. The devil is going to spread his propaganda and lies. And he's going to use people to tell you. He's going to use people to come to you to try to discourage you and to try to knock you off of the battlefield. But we cannot afford to believe lies. We cannot afford to believe propaganda of the enemy. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You see, we're not fighting people. I want you to look around this room. We're not fighting each other. So if there's animosity between you and somebody, go get it right tonight after service. Listen to me. Listen to me. And if you can't forgive, you go back on our YouTube channel. You go back on our Facebook and you look at Mark Morris. As you listen to Mark Morris' sermon he preached last Friday night. And if you can't forgive, you need to listen to that man because he has the authority to tell us we need to forgive. So if you got something against somebody in here, you, you need to take care of it tonight before you leave. I want you to hear what I'm telling you. Do not walk out of here with something against your brother or your sister because we're not fighting each other. But the devil wants us fighting each other. He wants us fighting flesh and blood. That's not what we're about tonight. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting against spirits and principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness. We're fighting parties without bodies, the evil rulers of this unseen world, those mighty satanic beings and great evil princes of darkness who rule this world and this city. I was astounded at the statistics that Pastor Kuhn brought the other night. 
If it was possible, my jaw, my mouth would have been on the ground. A jawbone would have fell. In all those categories, we're so much greater than the national average in violence. I hope we're grabbing a hold of what he's teaching us. And I am being eat up with it. It's not time to go on with life as normal. It's time to go to war. Because this is a battle we must fight. Brother Wilson, you got children that's counting on it. Y'all got children that's counting on it. Y'all got children that's counting on it. The devil wants to destroy your kids. He wants to take them and use them in the world. He wants them strung out on dope. He wants them pregnant, living a life of promiscuity. There's too much riding on this, honey. We need to get eat up with this. My God. There's an unseen world out there that's trying to destroy all of us. So we got to quit playing church. This is not just another Wednesday night. This Sunday is not just going to be another Sunday. But it's a war council. Hallelujah. Verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You see, truth and righteousness are a must in the battle we are in. False teaching and immoral lifestyles will get us spiritually killed. We must have integrity and moral correctness and a right standing with God. When's the last time you had a good praying through? When's the last time you cried in an altar and asking God to forgive you? You know what we need at Calvary? We need a good old-fashioned foot washing service. been a long time since I've been involved in a good old-fashioned foot wash. Let me tell you something. That will humble you. That will make you love your brother. That will make us get right with God when we humble ourselves to the point that we can wash our brother or our sister's feet. Truth and righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3 said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heat to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Look at your neighbor and say, That time is now. That time is now. Y'all, if there's ever time we need to be true blue, if there's ever time we need to be who we say we are, Time is now. Because this is a battle we must fight. This is a battle we must fight. There's too much riding on this. Right. Praise the Lord. Verse 15, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Our feet should have the firm-footed stability, the swiftness, and the readiness produced by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be the ones who are ready at a moment's notice to pull out the word of God and use it in this war. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. This shield will cover us. This shield will protect us from the flaming missiles of the enemy. The fiery darts. 
You see, there is power in this piece of equipment. There is power in faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 1, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is going to get us through the dry spells. Faith is going to get us because faith becomes substance of things hoped for. Faith becomes tangible. We see our children uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. We see the, the powers of hell and the shackles of hell broken from our family and friends. That is what faith does. It becomes substance. It becomes real. We can see it. We can taste it. If you've got lost children, you see them filled with the Holy Ghost and you thank God for it. That's faith. When you look at these empty chairs at Calvary, your faith sees people in these chairs. Your faith says we're going to have to knock walls out or, and build buildings uh, because there's going to be more people that we, can, that we can sit in here. That's faith. Uh, it becomes substance. It becomes real. That's what faith is. The evidence of things not seen. The 11th chapter of Hebrews went on to list many of the ones who moved out in faith. People who succeeded in great things. Abel is listed there. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Rahab. And maybe a couple more are listed in that chapter. Are people who, who moved out in faith and did great things for God. The devil will convince you that you're nothing. The enemy will sell you a bill of goods that you cannot be used in the kingdom of God. But you need to see yourself as a great soul winner. You need to see yourself as somebody that has the power of God and that God is going to use to do great things on this earth. Why can't all of you be soul winners? I know you don't believe it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I'm really an introvert. I know I come across as an extrovert. But I'm an, I'm an introvert. And I've always battled. And I'm just going to be transparent tonight. I've always battled that no one wants to hear what I got to say. Who are you? A nobody from nowhere. I've always battled thinking of myself as a man of God, as somebody that can preach the gospel, somebody who can teach a Bible study. I've always battled because people don't have the time of day to hear what I've got to say. People don't want to hear what I got to say. I'm nobody. But you know what? I want all of us to take that ideology and that propaganda that the devil has sold us for years. And we need to jettison it out of our lives. You are women and men of God that has something to tell people. You have a testimony that people need to hear. Uh, the Lord healed you one time miraculously. He provided for you miraculously. Uh, he touched your children. Uh, he raised them up. Uh, you have a testimony. Amen. And somebody wants to hear it. Uh, quit accepting that. Uh, I've had to come to the realization uh, that for many years I believed a lie. Who am I? He would tell me, you're just the son of a riverboat captain. My daddy was a riverboat captain, and he was a riverboat gambler. I don't have a pedigree. My daddy wasn't a pastor. But at some point, I had to say, devil, I'm a man of God. I'm an ordained minister of the gospel. I've got something to say. The Lord has done stuff for me that people need to hear. People need to hear the gospel. And you can say the same thing about you, sir. You're a man of God. You may not stand behind a pulpit, but you are a man of God. You are a woman of God. And you have something to say. Get out there and say it. Time is wasting. 
The sun is going down. There's people need to hear what you got to say. What you got to say. What you got to say. What you have to say. What you have to say. What you have to say. And you quit believing what the enemy has been putting down in your life. You quit picking up what he's putting down. He's a liar. I finally had to realize in my own life that he has no truth in him. If he's telling me one thing, I can believe the opposite of what he's saying. Praise the Lord. My, my, my. Don't allow the enemy to ever weaken your resolve because this is a battle that's worth fighting. This is a battle we must fight. Hallelujah. I think of the young people around here. They're worth fighting for. I think of the children. They're worth fighting for. I think of our friends in the community. They're worth fighting for. I made new friends today. Talk to them and witness to them. They're worth fighting for. This is a battle we must fight, church. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I've always thought of the helmet as covering the mind. I'm a football fan, and I've always noticed that obviously football players wear helmets to protect their head, protect their their mind and from concussions and things of that nature. But even they have problems with concussions even with that. But the helmet covers the head part of the person. Now, I've always thought that the mind, the brain, is, a, is like a computer. The mind, I've actually held a human brain in my hand, and it's just an amazing thing. You know, sometimes I try to just Mess my, I mess with my own brain. Anybody do that? Am I the only weird joker around here? My brain and your brain has an awesome amount of storage space. And just a, an enormous amount of random access memory. There's no computer in the world that is large as the storage capacity of the human brain. Sometimes, Brother Mike, I'll just go through my brain and start randomly remembering memories in my life. And one minute I'm thinking about our family vacation through 2007 into the Smokies. The next minute I'm thinking about that fishing trip I had with my daddy and I caught that brim. And I'm just bouncing back and forth in memories and, and, and I'm seeing all this stuff and I'm going, my Lord! How do you do that? The brain is an amazing thing that God has given us. The helmet of salvation covers that part of the body. It deals with facts and information. You know, we talked about the breastplate of righteousness just a little ways ago, and, 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 and this covers our perceived seat of emotions. Our emotions are here. When I see my, my grandbabies and they come up and say, Pop, Pop, I love you, I get all warm and fuzzy in here. When I want a piece of chocolate cake, I feel it in here. Not here. So my desires, everything emotional-wise is in this area, and we have to keep that righteous. We have to keep our desires and our wants and, and everything we need. we got to keep that righteous. But the helmet of salvation covers an organ that deals with facts. And I've always thought it amazing that the Bible talks about the helmet of salvation. Because when, when my seat of emotions and my desires is wanting something that I don't need, like that chocolate cake, or if I'm tempted to do something I shouldn't do, or go somewhere that I shouldn't go, 
My brain deals with facts. And I tell myself, I can't go there. I can't do that. I can't be a part of that. I'm not going to believe the lies of the devil. I'm not going to fall for his tricks. I'm not going to listen to propaganda and gossip that's trying to derail me. My brain, the helmet of salvation, I'm trying to get us to see tonight. The brain is where we're going to win salvation. Our mind is where we're going to win the battle. If we make up in our mind that we're not going to be defeated, guess what? We're not going to be defeated. You see, we've got to use our mind in this battle we're in. We've got to deal with the facts in this war we're in. We've got to analyze the situation, the facts, and the information we have and use our brain. Because it's in our brain, our mind, where we store the Word of God. I'm amazed at these kids and, and Bible quizzing. I've never been just real good at memorizing stuff. They tried to get me to memorize stuff in school. That's the reason I graduated without honors in 1985. But it's in here where we store this. Praise the Lord. Put on the helmet of salvation. The sword of the Spirit is our weapon. I like the way that one translation puts it. One translation said, and the sword that the Spirit wields, <laughs> which is the Word of God. You know, when we speak the Word of God, the Spirit backs that Word. That Spirit wails that sword. We're not in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy. When we speak the word, it activates the power of God. Everybody say, speak the word. Speak the word. Praise the Lord. The word of God in any form is a destructive force to the enemy. Personal devotion time in the word is powerful. Word that is preached or taught in open sessions such as this is powerful. Speaking the word in faith is a nuclear weapon that will destroy the enemy's plans for you and your family. There's power in the word of God. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You see, we should pray at all times, not on our knees like we do in our prayer times, our dedicated prayer, personal times, but Pray at all times means we are always in an atmosphere of prayer. You know, you can be in an atmosphere of prayer when you're riding on a tractor in a field. You can be in an atmosphere of prayer when you're working on the farm, on the job. What's wrong with somebody hearing you say, thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Lord. Pray at all times. Keep a watch at all times. Intercede in prayer for other people. You know, warfare has never been pleasant. I remember historic wars and the conditions of those wars. I remember in elementary school we talked about the Revolutionary War. And I remember reading about General Washington and his men wintering in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Y'all remember that? Do they teach kids in school about Valley Forge? Some of you youngins, help me out here. Did y'all learn about George Washington at Valley Forge? Anybody? Y'all did? Okay. It was very harsh conditions, I remember. Very cold. Food were, was in short supply. Uh, clothes, shoes were in short supply. They arrived in Valley Forge six days before Christmas of 1777. They were so weary from previous battles. They were tired. They were beat up, wounded. But the army of this new nation pressed on and endured and won the war. I want you to understand something here. Jesus never promised us that it would be easy. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus never promised us that. 
I would love to go back in time and find the fellow who decided that he needed to preach a prosperity message, a pie-in-the-sky mentality, that when you live for God, everything is hunky-dory. I'd like to have a little talk with that fellow. And I promise you, his life wasn't hunky-dory at all times, and he had problems and situations. The Bible says in Matthew 10 and 22, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. I'd like to add in the first book of Duane, chapter 1 and verse 1, I would like to add, He that fighteth. What did Paul say? I have fought a good fight. He that fighteth to the end shall be saved. You know why? Because this is a battle we have to fight. This is a war we must win. Jared Wilson, you got to win this war in your life. Dwayne Butler has to win this battle, this war. Bill Jones, you got to win. We ain't made it yet. I know we, we say we got saved a long time ago, and we like to say that, but ain't none of us saved yet. None of us has heard the gate, the pearly gate, click behind our heels yet. None of us have made it yet. There is still a fight to be fought. There is still a battle to enter. There is a war going on, and we are soldiers in that war. We're not saved yet. Praise the Lord. I don't want to bust any bubbles. Do we, we believe in one saved always saved around here? I thought we were apostolic. Jesus said, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. That word endureth there comes from a Greek word that I cannot pronounce, so I'm not going to try. But it means to bear trials, have fortitude, persevere. And if I was going to write that definition, I would have said, comma, fight. You see, this war is going to be producing some trying times. There's going to be days that you feel the pressure in the spiritual world because we are spiritual beings. We can feel what's going on in the spiritual realm. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've had two people this last couple of weeks say, Pastor, I feel something different about you. I have been fighting Spiritual battles. And I feel like some of you have too. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But there has been an onslaught against this church and against its pastors. I hadn't asked Brother Coon, but I'm sure he's feeling some of the same stuff. This is a battle worth fighting. This is a war that we got to... Stand up and toe the line. This is a war that we got to do and keep on keeping on. That's right. Praise the Lord. We must endure. We must fight. You know, war causes people to do things differently than they would in peacetime. Soldiers are not brought off the streets and placed in the battle. They learn to do specific things. They learn skills that they will need in the battle. They learn how to carry the rifle. They learn how to crawl across the battlefield. They learn how to do this and that. Things and skills they will need to fight the battle. If we are going to be effective in this war, there are some things we must do. There are skills that we need to learn. If we don't know how to do something, we better learn how to do it. Pastor Coon is trying to get us to learn how to pray in spiritual warfare. I forgot my sheet tonight, but I've been praying with my sheet. I saw you with yours, Sister Juanita. Bring that thing. There's four or five steps in there that teaches us what to pray in this spiritual warfare. Praise the Lord. So there's some things we need to do. Faith. We've got to have faith. Number one, faith. Everybody say faith. 
In Hebrews 11 and 1, the Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Got to have faith. Hebrews 11 and 6, For without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we got to have faith. we got to believe. You must believe that you're a tool in the hand of God. You must believe that you're a witness for God. You must believe that you can fight for God. you got to believe that you can tell somebody the gospel. you got to have faith. Number two, we got to be praying like never before. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, pray without ceasing. If you don't have much of a prayer life, develop one. It's critical that we're all praying across this church, every last one of us. From the pulpit to the last person back in the room, we got to start praying like we never have before because praying is powerful. We also got to fast. Matthew 17 and 15 says, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft time he falleth into the fire and oft into the water, and I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Matthew 17 and 21, how be it this kind goeth not out by, but by prayer and fasting. Who loves to fast? Raise your hand. Stand up. We want to honor you. We want to exalt your name. <laughs> Okay, so this is not going to take place unless there are a group of people praying and fasting. Everybody say next Monday. I want everybody that will to fast Monday. And I want you to stand to say you will help me fast Monday if you will. Many across the room. We're going to be bound together fasting. Monday's also going to be a day of prayer. Monday evening from 6 to 8, the church will be open for come and go prayer. After you pray, you come and pray. If you can't make it to the church, then you can pray at home. But after you pray that evening, you can break your fast. I didn't count, but there's like 20 Maybe 25 people that's going to be fasting. That's going to be powerful. That's going to be powerful. We're finna tear down some strongholds around here. And you know what? We're going to do this for a while. I'm going to take volunteers, and I think Monday is a good day. We come off the weekend, good church. And we're all going to fast. I want those that will. No forcing anybody to fast. If you have medical conditions, I'm a nurse. I know that there are medical conditions where you cannot fast to the extent that we're going to fast. You can do something. You can turn loose a Diet Coke, or You can do something. So some things only happen through prayer and fasting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next thing to do is be aware. Be aware of what's going on around us. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 and 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He wants to take you out, sir. He wants you destroyed, ma'am. Be aware of what's going on. Be aware. Be aware. So we're going to have faith, we're going to pray, we're going to fast, and we're going to be very aware of what's going on. We're not going to be sideswiped. Praise the Lord. Let's say and love God tonight. Lord Jesus, hallelujah. I thank you, Lord God, for all you're doing. I thank you, Lord God, for what's going to happen here at Calvary. Lord, as a church, Lord, we're fighting. This is a battle worth fighting. Lord, we claim victory for our children, for our friends, Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to see great things happen. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for protecting Zach, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for the healing that's taking place in his body. But we're going to see other people divinely 
healed and, and their lives interceded for, Lord God. Hallelujah. Jesus, we're going to see great things, Lord God, right here at Calvary, right here in North Springfield, Lord Jesus. Uh, there is a revival coming. There's great things coming. And we're willing to fight now to see it happen, Lord Jesus. We're willing to fight. We're willing, Lord God, to do what's necessary. Thanks so much for being here with us today. One thing we truly value at Calvary is community. And whether today is your first time joining us or Calvary has been your church for years, we truly want to connect with you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at springfieldcalvary.church and on Facebook. We believe God has something unique to say to you and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us and have a wonderful day, a wonderful week in the Lord.